Hello students, welcome to week three, lecture one. In this lecture, I'm going to be talking about integrated marketing campaigns. Now, I touched on these briefly in the week two lectures, but uh, in this lecture, we're going to dive deeper on this specific topic, and it is one of your assignments for this week. So here's your learning objectives. We're going to revisit the promotional mix, advertising, PR, personal sales, and sales promotion. And your goal here out of this lecture is to understand when you use these different elements for different target audiences for different products and services. And the third piece is to develop, uh, at least have a baseline understanding of how to develop an integrated marketing plan for specific targets and for specific products. Are we ready? Okay. Let's dive in. We only have one slide, and this is your slide. So I'm going to uh, be mostly talking on this and not giving you a whole bunch of slides to view. So if you recall from last week, we talked about an integrated marketing campaign. This is where you knit all of your components of the promotional mix together. Maybe not all four of them, but at least two or more of the promotional mix components of advertising, public relations, personal sales, and sales promotion. You'll see in the upper right of this slide, there's a video, and this is related to the California Cheese brand, which did a massive integrated marketing campaign when they first launched and branded California Cheese as a cheese brand that was competing with Wisconsin Cheese. So watch that video, and that'll serve you well for your assignment that is due this week. As I talk about these four components, advertising, PR, personal sales, and sales promotion, you will, um, I'm going to be giving you some examples of how California Cheese executed on each of those promotional mix elements. So take some good notes, and that will help you with your assignment for this week. Okay, so let's talk about advertising first. So advertising, whether that's traditional advertising, which can be print, it can be outdoor, it can be broadcast, TV and radio, you have to have money to spend on advertising, right? So this tends to be more commonly, especially with traditional advertising, I'm talking about TV and radio and magazine ads, billboards, this tends to be for large brands, large well-known brand names like uh, Nike and Coors and Toyota and Geico where they have these gener large generic audiences, meaning a lot of people buy their product, and it makes sense for them to advertise with a big hammer like traditional advertising. If you think about it, if you had a restaurant with just one location in San Diego, and you decided to run TV commercials, that would be a terrible use of your media dollars because you would be advertising to the entire San Diego TV market which goes up to Orange County and out to the Yuma El Centro border and down to Mexico. So that's just too big of a scope for that one restaurant, which let's say it's in Carlsbad. People aren't going to be driving all the way from San Ysidro to go to that restaurant. But you'd be surprised how often marketers misuse their media dollars uh, in this way. So advertising, the advantages of advertising is that you control the message. I said this in last week's message. You control the message and, um, and the timing of that message. So that's traditional advertising. Now, there can also be um, a smaller micro advertising, like social media has been a new venue that a lot of folks are using. So here you can get really granular. Like, say, for example, you decided, I want to reach African-American men ages 18 to 24 whose activities and interests include listening to classical music in the 92009 Carlsbad zip code. And through social media, you can actually, if there are any folks uh, with those demographic and psychographic parameters in that zip code, it'll find them for you. So one of the advantages of social media is that you can get super granular and you don't have to necessarily, you can still spend a lot of money on social media but you can control the amount of your spend. Uh, with traditional advertising, you're spending the money up front, hoping that you're going to get some responses back. And with social media, basically, it's a cost per click format, 
where you're paying as people click on your ad. No guarantee that they're buying, but at least they're engaging by clicking on the ad. So advertising is a paid message with a named sponsor. That's advertising. Let's move on to public relations. So again, advertising, big brands, well-known brands. Public relations. With public relations, you are getting free exposure of your message, and that's good, but you don't have any control if the media comes out and covers your product launch or your special event, or even if they cover you positively. So the types of businesses that do well with a PR campaign are businesses that have something that the media likes to cover. So this can be businesses that are eco groovy uh, and they're doing eco groovy stuff like a Tom's shoes or a Patagonia, or they have some uh, good works kind of corporate social responsibility elements to their business like a Ronald McDonald house or even Starbucks gives a lot of money to, uh, to uh, nonprofit groups and sustainable coffee and uh, fair trade coffee, things like that. So um, companies that have eco grooviness and or uh, media stories that the media would like to cover are more likely to use public relations. This is why so many businesses have what we call a 501c3 division of the company. That's a tax classification, but that basically means they kind of have a, a foundation or a good works division of the company that does corporate social responsibility stuff. Jack in the Box, when I was there, we had a Jack in the Box Foundation and we gave money to the Big Brothers Big Sisters organization. When I was at PECO, we had the PECO Foundation and we gave money to all the, uh, to PETA and other animal rights groups and let them do adoptions in our stores. Why? Partly because we wanted to keep those uh, stakeholders happy with our operations. We were selling animal products and they could get upset with us and give us bad publicity. And it was also a way for us to get some good media coverage for our stores. So it'll be companies that are eco groovy or it's more commonly used in the nonprofit sector. Nonprofits obviously get a lot of media coverage because they are by their nature doing good work. If you're uh, Meals on Wheels or the American Red Cross, you're more likely to get media coverage and they're less likely to spend money on traditional advertising because they are a nonprofit. Nonprofits also get uh, special ad rates with most media companies, whether it's broadcast or print. They have these what's called PSAs, public service announcements. Okay. Um, so that's public relations, more common in nonprofits. If you're a small company, you might have to use uh, PR to generate uh, marketing exposure for your business, but you want to have something that you can talk about. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time setting out press releases uh, for stuff that the media is not going to cover. So when you think public relations, you have to think, what's the media hook that's going to get them to come out and, and cover my business in the first place? Personal sales. Personal sales is simply salespeople. When do you have salespeople? Well, when there's products that have a lot of risk or more commonly in the business to business sector. So for example, uh, if you're Cintas, which is a company that does uh, first aid kits and also uh, uniform services, um, they're gonna have a rep who manages a territory in that account and he's gonna meet directly with his clients and place orders for them directly. So personal sales is direct spoken communication between buyer and seller. Direct spoken communication between the buyer and the seller, meaning the person that they're talking with can actually sell them the product. That's an important distinction when we get into the California cheese piece. Let me back up real quickly on public relations. Some examples of uh, PR for the California cheese assignment would be the uh, wine and cheese tastings that they did where they invited food influential chefs and, and food columnists to come in and taste wine and cheese with the hopes that they'd be getting some positive news stories about California cheese. And backing up to advertising for California cheese, they uh, had a number of efforts that they did to reach general consumers out in the marketplace. They had billboards, they had print ads, they had transit advertising, they had TV advertising, 
all designed to reach general consumers out in the marketplace. Okay, so back to personal sales. Um, <clears throat> There's the business, uh, businesses selling to other businesses like territories and accounts. And I gave you the CentOS example. And then there's also some consumer products uh, have salespeople. They tend to be, again, products that have risk, oftentimes because they're expensive, like a house or a car. Or they might just have uh, risk like uh, clothing or an engagement ring, which is both expensive and has a lot of psychological risk. Do I get the right one? Is she going to like it? Is she going to say yes? Right. So there's salespeople involved with that. So when there's a product that has a lot of risk, a consumer product, they tend to have personal salespeople or it's in the business to business sec sector. OK, Nate. So what were examples of personal sales on the California cheese uh, <clears throat> integrated campaign? Well, the short answer is there weren't. You might think, but wait a minute, what about the uh, what about the sampling that they did in the stores where they were giving folks samples of cheese to get them to buy cheese? Isn't that personal sales? It's not. Why? Because those salespeople aren't directly selling the product directly to the consumer. The product's actually already been sold to the retailer. So when you're in Costco and there's, sales, there's sampling people, they're not selling you product. They're pointing to where the product is on shelves in the, in the store. They're not selling it to you directly. That's the distinction. So sampling is actually a, a form of sales promotion, which I'll cover next. Okay, Nate, but what about the cheese mobile where they pulled up and gave people samples uh, right there? Again, the cheese mobile wasn't actually selling product. It was giving out free samples as part of their wine and cheese tastings. So that's sales promotion. Now, if the, if the cheese mobile was also being um, promoted through press releases to local media so they can come out and cover the cheese mobile as part of that wine and cheese tasting, well, then that would be public relations. So a lot of these things have multiple layers to it, right? They're not mutually exclusive. So the cheese mobile was an example of, of uh, public relations and also sales promotion, but it wasn't an example of personal sales. Personal sales is when there's direct spoken communication between buyer and seller, a real estate agent that's helping you sell the house. Uh, a, a car salesman is a classic example of that. Or it could be a shoe salesman at an upscale shoe store or clothing uh, where they're actually helping you do the transaction directly and they're responsible for that transaction. Anybody who's on commission is a salesperson and that's a personal sales example. Okay, and that leads us to sales promotion. Sales promotion is kind of the carnival category of integrated marketing campaigns. And the goal of sales promotion is to generate trial. What that means is sales promotion is meant to be short term, not permanent. Maybe you're launching a new product or maybe you're going into a new territory and you want to establish customer awareness. So categories and you saw these examples in the week two lecture two slides i gave you several examples of sales promotion so if this is unfamiliar to you you may want to go back and look at those slides but we see things like discounts and sweepstakes sampling um, these are all examples of sales promotion tactics generate trial now get people to buy the product it's meant to be short term it's meant to be to stimulate sales kind of like a shot in the arm some extra motivation to get people to buy or try the product what sales promotion is not intended to be is a permanent marketing strategy when you use sales promotion all the time what happens is you do what we call water down the brand you know think of an example that you might be familiar with is best buy if you've ever gotten went into Best Buy and bought something and filled out some information, you probably got a postcard from Best Buy about here's some special offers this month. And you keep getting those postcards every single month. And what happens is when you continually discount as a sales promotion strategy to get people to come to your business, you water down the brand and you train people to wait for the discount. You, in effect, reduce the price that people are willing to pay for your product. And when people are using sales promotion as a regular marketing strategy, it oftentimes means that they have some type of problem with the brand or with their products. They're trying to prop up sales 
by doing a lot of discounting. Take away the discounting and the customers no longer frequent the store. When you discount heavily, you're getting a certain type of customer that maybe isn't brand loyal. They're just in there for the discount. They're a Groupon customer, but they're not really your ideal customer. So companies that use sales promotion heavily as a central part of their campaign oftentimes have a problem. They might have a brand or a marketing problem. So you want to think sales promotion is meant to stimulate sales. It's meant to be short term. It's not meant to be permanent. So what were some examples of sales promotion on the California cheese uh, video? Well, we saw here we see a lot of in-store stuff, right? So they had signage in stores, complimentary products, uh, buy some California cheese, get a discount on eggs. Um, shelf displays where you could pull uh, discounts right there at the point of purchase, in-store signage. So these are retail consumers in the store. So we're seeing the different target audiences, right? Advertising was general consumers, public relations was food influentials, and sales promotion was retail customers in the store. Now, there, were, there was one personal sales component. The video went over it very quickly, and that was pizza restaurants. So they approached pizza restaurants directly and probably did a large contract with Pizza Hut and some other large chains uh, to give them a discount deal for buying California cheese. So, but that wasn't really clearly identified in the video. Okay, so that's an example of integrated marketing campaigns. I will say this, they are very complex to execute. There's a lot of moving parts. If you think about California cheese, which you know is the dairy board, they produce milk to integrate with all these cheese manufacturers, get them to put these branded stickers on their product and get all of these multiple advertising components and PR components and sales promotion components in stores to execute that properly is incredibly complex. So one of the things you're gonna hear me say uh, in this marketing class routinely is a lot of good marketing is tied to good execution. It's not about having a whole bunch of ideas. It's not about having the most creative idea. It has to be executed well. So give me a average marketing idea that's well executed any day over a fantastic marketing idea that's poorly executed. So Execution is central, meaning you are highly organized and coordinated and have all these parts communicated and organized and all these partners and retail channel partners are, are working with you to uh, make this thing successful. We'll talk about that more in later parts of the class. So thanks for listening. That's your lecture on integrated marketing campaigns.